Let's pray. Father, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is on the law of the Lord, and on this law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that bears fruit in its season. Lord, we ask that we would bear fruit by mer meditating on your law. Lord, let the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight. Do all that you want to do. In Jesus' holy, holy name, amen. Amen. So we're in Mark um, today, chapter 11. Uh, we've been running through Mark pretty quickly. I've been going fast, and now we're kind of slowing down a bit, um, just because I'm just realizing there's so much more in the Word that sometimes we need to just slow down and, and take it apart a little bit more. So we're in Mark chapter 10. Right after Mark chapter 10, we're just coming off of Jesus foretelling his death and his resurrection. Then Jesus had lastly, right after this, or right before Mark 11, he healed a blind man named Bartimaeus, who threw off his cloak and ran over to Jesus, and Jesus heals him and says, your faith has made you well. Now we're in Mark chapter 11, and in Mark chapter 11, there's really three kind of sections that we're going to be covering today. The first is called the triumphal entry. That's going to be from verses 1 to 11. Then we're going to see Jesus cursing the fig tree. That's verses 12 through 14. And then Jesus cleanses the temple, verses 15 through 19. So the triumphal entry, Jesus curses the fig tree, and then Jesus cleanses the temple. And we're going to finish up with the lesson from the fig tree, which is verses 20 through 25. So it's just kind of like reconnecting back to that fig tree part with the cleansing in the temple in the middle. So the entry, the fig tree, and the temple. So let's read verses um, and just start in Mark chapter 11. It says this, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and ben Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. Now some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And when they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches or palm trees that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So first of all, in verse 1, it says that they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. So it says that Jesus right now, he is on his way to Jerusalem where he would be caught and crucified and condemned for our sins and for our um, transgressions, that he would die on the cross. And he's on his way to Jerusalem right now. In Luke, it actually tells us that Jesus set his face like a flint to Jerusalem, that nothing was stopping him. He had a, his locked in focus to get to this place for our, so that he could die for us. I think it's kind of a picture of Jesus when he was born in that little town of Bethlehem. In Luke, it talks about there was these wise men and these wise men, they didn't know where to go. They didn't know how to get there, but there was this something called the star of David. And the star of David hung over um, that little place, that little barn that Jesus was born in. And those wise men traveled from afar, but they looked up at this little star and they set their face on that star. They locked in their focus and were able to make it to where Jesus was just by following the star. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says that we are to look forward at Jesus, the author and perfecter 
of our faith. And then so it says they drew near. And James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And just as this one text, we can see that there is a call, there is a challenge that the Holy Spirit is trying to show us through the word that we are to draw near to Jesus. Just like Jesus drew near to Jerusalem, the Bible says if we draw near to God, that he is going to draw near to us. If we go into that secret closet with the Lord, God guarantees to show up. And so it says, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into this village and immediately you're going to find a colt tied, which no one has ever sat. Untie it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say the Lord has need of it. So Jesus sends two of his disciples. We don't know who they are, but he gives them a direction. And their direction is to go to this little city and take out this colt or an ass or a donkey, which it was called. And they were to go there. Jesus sent them on a simple mission with a simple objective. Get the, tol- get the cult, untie it, and say the Lord has need of it, and bring him to me. Simple directions. And so two of his disciples, they do it. They answer what Jesus requests. It says they went away, found a cult, and they untied it. And those standing there said to them, why are you untying the cult? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the cult to Jesus. So they obeyed. And the amazing thing here, what's happening when they're grabbing the colt and untying it, they're actually fulfilling a prophecy. In the book of Matthew, um, chapter 21, it gives us Matthew's account of the same situation. In the Bible and the Gospels, there are often different accounts of the same events happening from different perspectives. And Matthew's perspective says in verse 4, Speaking of getting the donkey, he says, This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, and he quotes from Zechariah 9, 9, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the full of a beast of burden. So this whole event, what Jesus tells them to do is grab this donkey, get this donkey, and bring it back to me. All of this was to fulfill what was spoken back in the Old Testament by this guy named Zechariah, who was a prophet. And you see, the, the, the point here, or, or what the Holy Spirit is saying here, is that, is that sometimes Jesus tells us to do simple things. Go get the donkey. Go untie him. But when he tells us to do simple things, it's actually fulfilling a prophecy. It's actually fitting into a bigger picture than you can see when you obey the Lord in the simple. You see, when they're just grabbing this donkey, they might not know why. But Jesus is saying, here's why. It's because I'm fulfilling the prophecy and I'm going to come into Jerusalem like a king. And all the people are going to bow down to me. And maybe today you feel like you are doing things that are mundane. The, hear the word of the Lord for you today. He's saying that that mundane, that obedience to Jesus and just that little mundane thing, that little simple thing that he's telling you to do is actually fulfilling his bigger picture. Maybe you feel like I don't want to wake up today and, and go pray for this person. I feel tired, but you feel like the Lord's putting on your heart to pray for someone. Sometimes you go up to them and pray for them, and you might not think much of it, but in their lives, you're, you're actually speaking life into them. Maybe you see someone hurting, and you just want to encourage them with a word, maybe a Bible verse, maybe just a simple encouragement. Maybe you want to pay for someone's meal and invite them out to eat and ask them how they're doing. Maybe it's such a simple thing that the Lord's telling you to do. Maybe it's as simple as washing the dishes. Whatever it is, the Lord wants you to know That the Lord, he says, he has need of it. Jesus is concerned with your obedience, even in the small things, to fulfill a bigger picture. And so what is the Lord telling you today? What is that small thing that maybe you do every day that you're maybe tired of doing? The Lord wants you to know that those little things are for bigger pictures. And so it says they untied the colt. And they unbound it. I really love the word unbound is the same word that's used in John 
um, chapter 11, when it talks about Lazarus, who was in the tomb. In John chapter 11, um, Lazarus was in the tomb. He was dead. And he was in the grave for four days. And then Jesus comes on the scene to this dead person. And he says, when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips, his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. So there was this guy named Lazarus who died. And similar to the donkey, he told the disciples to unbind that donkey and set him free. In the same way, this man, Lazarus, Jesus came to his grave and said, unbind him. Take away those linen straps because Lazarus is not dead. Come out. And he says, come out. And this man rises from the grave and he's alive and he's living. And this is also a picture of Jesus when he rose again. In John chapter 20, um, it says, so Simon Peter runs into the tomb after Jesus rises again. It says this, then Simon Peter came in following him and went into the tomb. This is the tomb where Jesus resurrected. John chapter 20, verse 6. And following him, he went into the tomb and he saw the linen cloth lying there and the face cloth, which Jesus head was lying with the linen cloths and folded up in a place by itself. You see that linen cloth that was wrapped around Jesus was unbound by the Lord. Jesus rose again and those things that bound him down, those cloths that were wrapped up because the whole world thought he was dead were unbound. Just like that donkey that says, unbind him. The Lord shows us that he takes away, he unbinds us from our chains. Just like Jesus had rose again from that grave, he was no longer bound. Romans 6 says that death no longer has dominion over him. In Romans 8, it says the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. So whatever you're stuck in, maybe it's a sin, maybe it's uh, a relationship issue, maybe it's just this fear, this insecurity, this anxiety. God wants you to know that he is in the business of unbinding, of unloosing and unshackling those chains. You know, there's that song, there is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, break every chain. And Jesus breaks every chain. And so they get this donkey. It says they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and sat on it. So there's the donkey. They put the cloaks on top of the donkey and Jesus sits on it. And it says they throw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches on that they cut from the fields. So they get the cloaks. They spread them on the ground. They get the branches. They cut them off the trees and they're waving them and they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So palm trees here, they represent goodness and victory. And the cloaks represent an act of submission. It was the way that they would honor a king. So they put the cloaks on the ground and Jesus comes in humble on a donkey. You see, Jesus came in on a donkey. Now, a donkey was different than a horse. A horse represented power and war. A horse represented warfare. And a donkey represented work. Asses at that time, they were meant to just simply plow through and do their work. But a horse was meant for war. And Jesus, the first time he comes, he comes in on a donkey so that he can accomplish the work of the cross, the work of forgiveness, the work of sealing the believers who believe on the name of Jesus. But Jesus, in Revelation 7, verse 9, is coming back. Sorry, in Revelation chapter 19, Jesus is coming back on a horse to wage war. And he's coming as a king. It says, in, and John has a vision of revelation of Jesus when he comes back. In Revelation 19, verse 11, it says this, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in his righteousness judges and makes war. 
And it describes Jesus, but he's coming back on the horse at the end times to wage war on those who do not believe. You see, first time, Jesus comes humble on a donkey with grace and truth. The second time, he comes in wrath and in fury to judge those who have rejected him. And so he comes humbly. This is not the picture of the king, but this is a picture of the servant. Jesus says, or uh, Mark records that Jesus said, the son of man came not to serve, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so they're all crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The word Hosanna means save us. They're crying out, save us. They recognize that Jesus was the king, but soon after they would say, crucify him. And he entered Jerusalem, went into the temple, and when he looked around at everything, it was already late, and he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So there's the triumphal entry. Now we're going to see Jesus curse the fig tree. It says this in verse 12. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. I really like that. Let's stop there. Jesus was hungry. Jesus was a man that was tempted in every way like us. Hebrews says that, in the book of Hebrews, it says that he was tempted like us in every respect, yet without sin. He had faced every single temptation that we had. In John chapter 4, it says that Jesus, he was going to this town called Samaria, where he would give water, the water of life, to the woman at the well. And as he's walking there, he says, or, or John records, Jesus sat down, wearied as he was from his journey. And man, maybe you feel sometimes weary and hungry. And it's okay to see that Jesus, who was the Son of God, became a man and was subjected to every temptation. He was hungry. He knew what it was like to be weary. He knew what it was like to relate to you. So we can relate to him in our prayers when we come to him because he he knew what it was like to be hungry. And so he saw in distance a fig tree in leaf, and he went to see if he could find anything on it. But when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. So we're going to come back to this next section. Jesus cleanses the temple. And they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written? My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him. Because the crowd was astonished at his teaching, and when evening came, they went out of the city. Amen. So Jesus, he goes into Jerusalem after the whole Jewish crowd is worshiping him, praising him, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then he comes into the temple, which was his house, which was his father's house, which was the church. And he sees instead of prayer going on, people selling oxen, selling sheep, and making these illegal, inappropriate trades. And Jesus, he has zeal inside of him. The scripture says that zeal for your house will consume me. For zeal, which is the word for excitement and power and motivation, this motivation, this fervency, this urge, this angst would consume Jesus when he saw the blasphemy going on in his father's house. And he freaked out. He said, he flipped the tables. He drove out the money changers with a whip. It says another scripture says he made a whip of cords and drove them out. But yet when Jesus did this, was this was not sin. This was not sin. This was righteous anger. This was an anger that was justified. This was an anger that was for the things of God. And sometimes the Lord will, will give you a passion for the things of God. You see, if you love The truth, if you love the truth, you will hate the lies. And Jesus hated the lies. 
But this hate was no sin. It was in perfect love. It was out of love. And it says they actually feared him. Everyone feared Jesus. Now Jesus, he was not some soft, weak kind of little guy. I I'm guessing he was a carpenter, we know. So he was probably pretty strong. He was lifting with his hands and he was had burly arms. He would scoop up the kids in his arms and he was not weak. He was not someone to mess with. You see, Jesus, although he was a gentle lamb of God, he also taught with authority and he also had this side of him that you did not want to mess with. And so he comes into the crowd. He knocks everything down. And the question from Jesus cleansing the temple is we see that Jesus, he was angry at sin. He was angry at the church being twisted. And it was be called a den of thieves. And the question is, what makes you angry? What sort of things get you frustrated like, what really pushes your buttons? Is the things that push your buttons when your family member doesn't give you a ride to school is the thing that pushes your buttons, sorry, that you're not making enough money financially? Is the thing that's pushing your buttons similar to what pushed Jesus' buttons? Is it that there's no word being preached in the church? Is the thing that pushes your buttons that those who love God are not following him? Is the thing that pushes your buttons things of God or the things of man. I hope that the thing that upsets you or the thing that you're passionate about or the thing that eats up your heart is your love for God and that you're not getting upset with foolish vanity things that have no matter in eternity. So now we continue with the fig tree and it says as they passed by in the morning they saw the fig tree that same fig tree that Jesus just cursed and they saw it withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered him, have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever has, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. And if you have anything against anyone, so that your father who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. So Jesus curses this fig tree. You see, this fig tree represents Israel. You see, it was in the Bible, in Isaiah chapter 5, the fig tree was represented as the vineyard. Let me find Isaiah 5. Let me just read it. This is a love song to the vineyard. Um, this is God speaking through Isaiah the prophet. Let me sing for my beloved, verse 1, for my love song concerning his vineyard. For my beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines he built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste that shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will command the crowds that no rain will rain upon it. See, the vineyard represented Israel. And Jesus, he was saying that, look, he looked for Israel to be the people of God that would recognize Jesus as the Messiah. And Jesus knew that they would soon deny him and say, crucify him. And they would cast him out of Jerusalem to be condemned to death. And Jesus is saying here that he's cursing this fig tree, saying that there is no fruit coming out of you. You are cut off. Your time was up. Your chance was up. But then Peter's amazed at this. And he says, how, did, how are you able 
I mean, Peter was like, Jesus, how are you able to curse this fig tree and just make it die like that? I mean, you just, you cursed it and it just withered up the next day. And Jesus gives us the secret to prayer here, the secret to his effectiveness. He says, truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. So Jesus now gives us an important lesson on prayer. Um, and this verse is often taken out of context. Or some uh, preachers say that you've got to say to this mountain of finances, be moved and it will be moved and God will bless you financially if you just believe. And, and there's this teaching that Whatever you ask for, just believe in it and God will give it to you. But the context is key. When reading the Bible, you have to read it in the context. So the context of the fig tree is that there was no fruit and it withered. It was, it was about bearing fruit, bearing forth, reproducing Christ's image. John 15 talks about bearing fruit. God says that I've appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. God says, I actually chose you to be a follower so that you would bear fruit. And if you don't bear fruit, you're going to be cut off from Christ. And it says, uh, let, let me go back on that. I might have, well, I don't want that to be taken wrong. Not that you'll be cut off from Christ, meaning that Christ will no longer forgive you. For Romans 8 says that nothing will separate you from the love of God, but you're going to be having a hard time connecting with the Lord, you're not going to be fruitful if you continue to not stay close to him and abide in him. But it says here that if you have faith in God, if you have faith that God can produce fruit in you, see, that's the key. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, this mountain refers to the fruitlessness. This mountain, this this object of, of fruitlessness, of, of deadness, of spiritual dryness, that's the mountain that's being referred to spiritually here. And it might look like the spiritual dryness is a mountain. You can't overcome it. But if you say to that mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and do not doubt, but believe it will come to pass. So in the Bible, in James, it says that if someone asks in faith, then they'll receive it. But if you have doubt, then the Bible says that you're a double-minded man, unstable in all your ways, and you're not going to receive anything from the Lord. See, faith is the fire of prayer. Faith is what makes the prayer come true. And then so Jesus says, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've already received it, and it will be yours. This is something I practice when I pray. When I'm praying for something, I'm saying... God, I pray that you would help me to love more. God, I thank you that you've already given me this love. I can't wait to see how you've, you've already answered this prayer. So something I do in my language of talking to God is I already thank him that he's given me the, the request I'm asking. And now I'm saying I can't wait to see what you're going to do through it. So now I'm living in expectancy of that answer to that prayer, to whatever my request was. So one... Have faith. Faith is the fire to prayer, especially in the case here of unfruitfulness, of confessing your sin. Have faith that Jesus really will take care of the things in your life that are causing you to not bear fruit. And you see, the number one thing that's causing you to not bear fruit is your sin. It's the things that hold you back from Christ. It's the things that you're stuck in and that you can't get out of. And you, maybe you're here, you're stuck in something. You're saying, how do I get out of it? Just pray to God and say, Lord, remove this sin from my life. Thank you for removing it and help me to just cut it right out. Just knock it off. Cut it out. Uh, one, one of the teachers I listened to in the Bible, someone came up to this man and said, I want to stop my, stoking, my smoking problem. I just see, can't seem to, to stop. And the pastor just laid his hands on him and said, in the name of the of Jesus, you're freed from smoking. And the man just believed that he was free from it and he just completely cut it out and never did again. Now, smoking's not necessarily a sin or anything, 
but just believe that God has delivered you from what you're asking from him. Believe that you don't have to be caught up in it and that you can bear fruit. For whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it. It will be yours. You see, believe that the power of sin is no longer having dominion over you in your life. In Romans 6, it says, reckon yourselves dead to sin and alive to Christ. That means change your mindset. Romans 12 says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But Romans 6 says, reckon yourselves dead to sin. So now I look at sin and I say right in the face, you have no more power over me. You have no more dominion over my life. You have no more conquering over me. I am dead to you, sin. I am alive now to you, Jesus. And you keep your eyes on Jesus. And that's how you overcome your sin. And that's how you bear fruit. And also it says, if you stand praying, forgive, so that your heavenly Father may forgive your trespasses. And so forgive, that is a huge part of prayer. If you are trying to pray to God, um, but you have this unforgiveness in your life, it will actually limit your prayers. It will limit the answers. So every time you come to him, make sure that you are constantly saying, is there someone in my life that I'm not forgiving? Because unforgiveness is really a dark place to be. So we saw the triumphal entry, the curse, the, the fig tree, and then the um, Jesus cleansing the temple. And so... Um, so things to apply is remember how Jesus was unbound or he unbinded that donkey. What are the sins that are un, that are binding you? Just think about those. Another thing to think about is Jesus. He gave them a simple instruction that had a bigger vision. So is there something in your life today that's a simple thing to do? A simple instruction that you need to be faithful in. And the other assessment that you should make is, are you bearing fruit? Are you bearing fruit in your life? Are you blessing others? Are you seeing God work through you? And if you're not, ask God to help you. And that's all. Thank you so much. See you.